I think a lot of people have an okay enough, maybe not to the full extent, but they have an okay enough understanding of how damaging our prison system is on our society, uh, especially to people of color, but it affects our entire society. Who does benefit from our current prison system? Because the, the people are, there are a small group of people who are benefiting from it and profiting off of it. Who, who is actually the people who are gaining power and money from this, uh, who have a vested interest in keeping things the way they are? And, you know, I think it's important, Matt, that you noted both the issue of power and the issue of money. Mm -hmm. Because the mass incarceration or the prison industrial complex is not simply a financial concern. Right. It is about a political agenda. And that political agenda, as I described before, was a, about putting in place a punitive, a punishment ethos rather than a, a social welfare or a developmental kind of ethos. Punishment rather than rehabilitation when people are, in, are incarcerated. So politicians with a law and order agenda as well as law enforcement agencies have gained great amounts of power in the shift to away from the welfare state. And this has been translated into resources for for policing functions. So we've seen a great expansion in SWAT squads. We've seen a great expansion in the provision of armaments through programs in the federal government providing local police with M16s, M14s, armored personnel carriers, a whole range of warfare uh, oriented equipment which seems inappropriate for dealing with the population in most communities and seems to be characterizing the people on the streets as some kind of enemy. But there's also people who have just nakedly financially benefited from the expansion of prisons and jails. The most well known of these are the private prison operators, companies like the Corrections Corporation of America, the GEO Group. The, the, one of the founders of the Corrections Corporation of America, Tom Beasley, said back in the 1980s that he thought he could sell prisons in the same way people could sell hamburgers. So those private prisons have gained some foothold in the system, particularly in building immigration detention centers. But there's also a whole host of companies that build prisons, architectural firms that design prisons. There's healthcare companies that provide services to prisons and jails. There's food uh, providers such as Aramark, a very famous food provider, which has recently had a couple cases of having maggots in the food in some of the prisons where they serve. There's a whole host of companies that have made money out of the expansion and the continued operation of prisons. So it's become a situation whereby people in political circles gain, but also people from a business end gain. And lastly, we shouldn't exclude the people who are employed by departments of corrections, particularly prison guards, we have about 400,000 prison guards nationally, and some of them make upwards of six, of six figures a year through overtime schemes and so forth. So the prison industrial complex has been very good to them, and they're quite active in trying to promote harsher drug laws and so forth to keep the population growing. I'm talking again to James Kilgore, author of the new book, Understanding Mass Incarceration. In the book, you have a section entitled the gendered threads of punishment. Uh, explain what exactly do you mean by that? Well, I think it's important that, that, that you raise that, Matt. The, we know that really about 90% of the people who are incarcerated are men. And so most of the focus tends to go on the people who are actually locked up. But for every one person who's locked up, there's a whole range of loved ones and connections in communities that are left behind. And what happens to the people that are left behind, they have to try to grapple with the fact that perhaps a major source of income for their household has disappeared. A major source of parenting support has also disappeared. And major forces of building communities, of building institutions like schools and churches and clubs and so forth in the community are also gone. And the people who are left behind are overwhelmingly mothers, daughters, spouses, sisters of men who are locked up who are forced to shoulder these burdens. And these burdens have become even 
more difficult because we've seen cutbacks in the provision of public housing, of mental health services, of substance abuse, of public education provision, so that they're trying to survive in the communities that are even more difficult for people of low income than when their loved ones were, were with them. So all of these burdens have shifted onto a largely female cohort that's, that's, that's left behind. Plus we have an increasing incarceration of women as well. The, the, the incarceration of women has increased rapidly since the early 1990s at a much faster rate than men, but still they're a minority. But we have to include, when we talk about the impact of mass incarceration, we have to realize that it impacts communities as well as individuals. And these communities are largely poor communities of color in urban areas. Thank you.